Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. My name is not Stephanie Fenkert. Uh, she is the one usually uh, addressing you at the beginning, and she is uh, executive director of the Institute for International Peace. Uh, my name is Vedran Jihic. I'm senior researcher at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, uh, and I have the honor to welcome you to the event, to the panel discussion dedicated to Serbia, discussing the legacy of Zoran Jinjic, and I'm quite sure looking into the future uh, of Serbia and Serbian society. At the beginning, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, but, I mean, the, the biggest thank, uh, uh, thank you goes to International Institute for Peace, Hannes Svoboda, Stefanie Fenkert. You managed to put a wonderful panel together. Thanks to Rena Institute, who since years has supported and has been supporting the Western Balkan activities of the International Institute for Peace uh, and together with OIP and RENA Institute and EIP, we managed a lot in the last uh, few years. Uh, before I turn to Luka Cekic, who is going to be a wonderful moderator tonight, uh, he usually is a wonderful moderator and a wonderful student and colleague, just three quick notes on the topic. I just came from Belgrade last week on Thursday, uh, was spending a few days discussing with my friends and colleagues. And my three remarks will be quick. Uh, the first one is uh, remembering the past and dreams from the past, thinking back to Jinjic times. Uh, the desert of the present, as I will describe it, and the hopes for the future. Uh, and last week, when I was strolling down the streets of Belgrade, uh, you could hear people discussing uh, about, obviously, what is going on in Serbia, but referring to the dreams of the past. Dreams of the past when Djindjic took over, when Milosevic uh, was forced to leave uh, and extradited to, to The Hague. Uh, dreams of a better Serbian society, of democracy in Serbia, of rule of law, of transparent institutions, of accountability. Uh, so much about the dreams from the past. The desert of the present. Serbia, unfortunately, has been uh, a society that backslided in terms of democracy. Unfortunately, in the club of Turkey, Hungary, and some others, when it comes to the quality of democracy, and uh, nowadays I think we can safely describe it as competitive authoritarian regime, uh, with certain islands of competition, but with a strong control of Serbian Progressive Party uh, and President Vucic. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, today, 20 years after Jinjic was killed, we discuss the same issues that were on the agenda back then. Uh, we discussed the issue of Kosovo in Serbia. Jinjit and Ivan Veroda is going to tell you probably uh, not only anecdotes, but a lot about uh, efforts of Jinjic to address the question. 20 years ago, two decades ago, we discuss uh, how to restart uh, the process of the European integration. Uh, that was quite promising back then, and today uh, Serbia is at least formally a front runner, uh, but in real terms, uh, the membership perspective is quite far away. So basically, that's the status quo uh, that I describe as a desert of the present. Uh, and then the hopes for the future. I think, in, I mean, a society, every society needs a vision. Uh, needs a vision and needs to imagine itself projecting itself into the future. And I think we can't give up on imagining and hoping and working towards a better, different Serbian society. A Serbia that is democratic, a Serbia that is member of the European Union, a Serbian society that is liberal, that embraces the human rights and fundamental values, a Serbia that is a peaceful neighbor uh, to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Kosovo, etc., etc. And this is certainly something that I hope the panel will uh, pick up and discuss tomorrow. We are not going to give up uh, on this important goal. So, without further ado. You said everything. <laughs> So with what I do now to Luka Cekic, he is going to introduce uh, the panel of tonight. Uh, and uh, after the discussion, I'm quite sure there is a glass of wine, as usually at the International Institute for Peace, which is a wonderful host. Uh, enjoy the evening. Uh, and uh, I don't have 
fun <laughs> is probably difficult to say, uh, but engage in uh, discussions with this wonderful panel tonight. So, Luca, do you need the mic? No, no, it's okay. So, I would like to welcome you all at the International Institute for Peace. And again, I would like to just repeat that we are very grateful and thankful for the cooperation with the OEP and the Karl Renner Institute. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to open up this panel first, maybe via a short compilation video which we have made with uh, experts from, the, from Serbia, both from the political side but also from the civil society side. So maybe we can play the video and then we can proceed with the panel. Zoran Cinciic had the vision of Serbia as an open and democratic society based on uh, individual rights and freedoms and the vision of Serbia as a developed country that is part of Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, today we witness that uh, we are far f uh, away from uh, this original vision of Zoran Đinđić and the Serbia is currently not not yet a member of uh, of the EU not even the NATO as well and uh, today we witnessed that um, rule of law and democracy are in retreat uh, and the um, country is still run by reactionary and nationalistic forces that were in power during the 90s, that uh, constantly challenge that vision of uh, Zoran, uh, Zoran Džinđić. I would say that uh, Džinđić's legacy is alive today and uh, mostly because of the people who were part of his government who are still very vocal about uh, what has been done back in the days when Gigi's government was active, but also thanking to many historians who deal with Gigi's legacy uh, and who wrote uh, a lot about uh, his uh, philosophic work, but also what he has achieved uh, in politics and how, uh, how important uh, his legacy is today. The main message and the, the main political legacy of Zoran Džinđić for me personally and for the Democratic Party is he was a brain man with clear vision and he had a, a clear vision how to achieve these goals. And these goals, rule of law, democracy uh, and uh, better society, uh, better life for, for the Serbian citizens, I, uh, I am afraid that after 20 years we don't have that. And I think that we, if we talk about political legacy of Zoran Đinđić in this moment, uh, we need to, to find a way to achieve these goals again. So I think uh, 20 years ago we are on the same path. We fight for democracy and we are fighting for the rule of law. I would say Đinđić's legacy is quite strong in Serbia. He was the architect of uh, the regime change in 2000 when the citizens of Serbia deposed dictator Slobodan Milosevic and uh, entered uh, this path of uh, EU accession, opening towards the West, uh, creating a democratic society. And even though we see that in the last several years the trends have been largely negative, I would say that Jinjit still remains a symbol of, of that change and all the positive developments which cannot be undone uh, so easily. So uh, his legacy remains strong and um, he has become in a way a half mythological creature where people are literally bragging about knowing him while, still, while he was still alive and uh, when we actually look at the time when he was in politics and later when he was the prime minister he was not really a popular figure and he was quite often criticized uh, by many who would later basically see him as a, as a, live, as a legend. Um, also what is worth, uh, worth noticing is that um, uh, there are many groups, including political parties in power, that want to erase the legacy of uh, Zoran Đinđić and what he did before. So this is quite active. Uh, and a long time ago, uh, that process started in 2012 when 
uh, the current political establishments wants to erase uh, collective memory of the 5th October and what 5th October meant to the society and want to erase what Zoran Djindic did or wanted to do to transform Serbian society uh, and the state. So these forces are still uh, in power and in a 10 years uh, since now I don't see that um, I believe that they will be dominant. Their, their like, vision of the society will be uh, still dominant. I would say that media propaganda did a lot uh, to counter uh, Jinjit's legacy and to present him as mafia boss or someone who has been uh, engaged uh, with mafia uh, back in the days. Uh, because those strong opponents of Jinjic, um, their their goal is to undermine what has been done in in uh, during dur during his days, and to try to uh, destroy the positive myth that has been created around Jinjic. So, despite uh, several negative trends, um, Jinjic's legacy cannot be undermined so easily. Uh, some of the things that have been achieved in 2000 um, are simply irreversible. Serbia is now a country which is at least formally on the path towards uh, uh, EU accession, is formally at least a democratic uh, a country and a, a country which basically remains uh, on good terms with most of its neighbors and uh, the Western world and belongs to Europe in a way, belongs to the uh, your pan family of, of countries and uh, in that sense his legacy cannot be um, tarnished or removed just uh, due to the fact that some of the political actors who were there in 2000 have uh, come back in power and that uh, many of the negative phenomena we could have seen in Serbia in the 90s are now back. Still the main trajectory remains uh, the one which Jinjic has launched uh, not only him, of course, but he was, I would say, uh, not only a former leader of the democratic opposition of Serbia, but also a person who is uh, a symbol of, of that change. After 20 years, uh, you have so many groups uh, and parties who tried to, uh, to, to own this political legacy of uh, Zoran Djidic, and that's a problem. And you have a very, very bad interpretation and uh, unsuccessful interpretation of political uh, legacy of uh, Zoran Djidic. And I think the best proof of that is to see Serbian society today. Uh, we are now in the National Assembly of Republic of Serbia. Uh, you, do, you cannot do that, but if you can to go in and to, to see the debate that we have in the parliament, you will have a clear picture. We don't have a real debate, we don't, ha we don't uh, have democratic procedures, we don't have a opposition, uh, don't have any right to reply to the representatives of ruling, of ruling party. So 20 years after, we are still on the same path and we uh, didn't uh, achieve the goal that Zoran Djidic uh, has as a vision and that's democracy, rule of law and Serbia in the European Union. New leaders um, in, in our society that promote that vision and values of Zoran Djindic uh, are no longer only those that we knew uh, before, such as Democratic Party of Serbia. I believe that, that new leaders that want to change uh, the society and improve um, the society are those who are coming from an ecological movements, for, from different civic movements uh, that we have seen at the local level, but also uh, in Belgrade. But um, those are the like new mm -hmm. new leaders, but uh, they need to gain uh, more popular popular vote. They need to gain more strength uh, in order to become more vocal and more dominant uh, power in the society. What we lack since 2003 is that energy in politics and the willingness to do things and to finish 
some processes and to be aware of the importance of the historic momentum to do something. I think that Gingic was very aware of his responsibility to do things and to make changes back in the days. But uh, I haven't seen a politician after him uh, with such approach, with sense of historic momentum uh, to do something. I'm afraid that this generation, the people who have 18, 20 or 25 years, you know, uh, they they don't have this alive memory of him, and I think that's uh, that's a very big problem. Also, if we talk about educational system or uh, this interpretation of modern history in the historical textbooks, you cannot find much information about Zoran Djidic. You can find maybe five sentences or six or seven, maybe ten, mm -hmm. but y you you don't have enough. Uh, young people don't have enough information. Uh, to, 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 to make their own vision of Zoran Vidic's mm -hmm. political legacy, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, we, we somehow, we, we managed to, uh, to talk uh, a lot ab about Zoran Vidic, but we don't talk a lot ab about this political legacy mm -hmm. and these goals that he tried to, to, to achieve. I believe that young people cannot really comprehend the role of Zoran Vidic in Serbian politics because uh, the revolution of the 5th October 2000 has been painted uh, in the public discourse in the last several years as a negative, uh, as something negative, something which was basically about stealing chairs from the parliament and not removing an authoritarian regime. Uh, there is now this narrative that actually the 90s were a period of uh, prosperity and that the crisis began after Milosevic was removed and after he became prime minister and then that this basically negative trajectory lasted until 2012. In this narrative, it is impossible to understand the importance of the revolution of 5th October 2000 and impossible to understand what did Djindic mean for Serbia in only these uh, two, uh, a bit more than two very brief years while he was the prime minister of Serbia. Uh, Serbia is in the process of um... Uh, EU integrations, uh, but in practice we are far away from uh, becoming mm. a full-fledged EU member. So there is a lot of work to be d done uh, and uh, we need uh, more of, like democratic leaders uh, with that vision of Zoran Djindjic that will lead to uh, not only for Serbia to become a developed country, but democratized and modernized uh, as a society. Uh, but today uh, we seen that uh, there are a lot of reactionary forces, including the right-wing groups and the church, that is opposing to that uh, uh, different vision that uh, Jinji had. And they promote more collective values and collective identity that uh, contrary to what uh, Zoran Djidjic actually promoted. Actually, we, are, we need to, some, to have some kind of revitalization of political goals and political agenda that Zoran Djidjic achieved, and the Democratic Party is uh, very strongly dedicated to that. Serbia will hopefully become a member of the EU and will uh, uh, define its foreign policy that is oriented towards the West rather than the East. So I really see that Serbia is not an ally of Russia today, uh, even though many try to, to put it that Serbia is a um, uh, loyal ally of Russia in the Balkans, which I believe it's not true. And secondly, I, I think that Serbia will recognize the momentum or Serbian political elites, the importance of this momentum to be on the positive side of history. Uh, and if you look the 20th century, Serbia in two world wars was on the positive side. So I believe that it will be the case today as well. So, let us start with the panel. This was the short compilation of the interviews that we have done in Serbia and Belgrade, so that you can maybe have a better overview how the young people in Serbia look upon Zoran Djindjic and the current situation in Serbia, but also on the transition. 
So let me introduce our first guest. It would be Ivan Vevoda. He is the former senior advisor on foreign policy and European integration of Prime Minister Zoran Djindjic. So Ivan, let's maybe start with the first question. Since you have worked directly with Zoran Djindjic and with his firstly elected democratic government of Serbia, what was the work experience? How would you describe it? What was the energy, the motivation, the willingness to make a change? Thank you very much, Luca, and it's a real honor to be here tonight uh, with Sofia Lida and, and Hannes uh, to speak about this in, in, a, in a difficult um, anniversary of 20 years um, in, in five days' time of his assassination. In fact, if I may, just a few recollections on that day, uh, he had asked me to step in for him to give a speech at a UNDP event in Belgrade. Some of you may remember he had a problem with his Achilles tendon, and he called me in the evening and he said, could you step in and, and go to this event? And so I did, and it was in the middle of this event that the Minister of Interior, uh, who was there with us, he suddenly left the room at one moment and came back, didn't say anything, then went out, and then eventually he said that uh, the Prime Minister had been killed. And so we had to stop the event and I had to rush back to the Prime Minister's office. The whole city was blocked and because I had my pass from the Prime Minister's office, the policeman stopped me, saw my pass and, and most of them were crying, uh, realizing that this was a, a, an extremely difficult moment. And on the day of the, of the funeral, you, and I say this for a reason, on the day of the funeral there were, about, there were more than half a million people following the, the coffee. And I say this because there were very many people criticizing uh, Prime Minister Djindjic and people from kind of our liberal democratic circles that he was too pragmatic, he was dealing with left and right and really not following a very kind of strict uh, ideological line, only to realize, of course, that he was fully on the right course and I may add that when he called me to join him, some of my friends said, are you sure you want to join him? Are you sure that you know, he is going in the right direction? I said, absolutely, I'm sure. And if I feel that he is veering off the course, I will, I will leave. Uh, in 2000, uh, after the changes, he offered me to be ambassador in Washington for Serbia, and I refused. And he was very surprised, and, I said, and he said, why, why don't you want to be ambassador? I said, look, I want to be part of the change, of the democratic change. We've wasted 10 horrible, catastrophic years of Milosevic's regime. We have fallen behind, and I want to be part of this effort. And it is only later than in 2002 when he called me to be uh, his advisor, uh, I was then working for the Soros Foundation, the Fund for an Open Society Yugoslavia, and his secretary called me and said, the Prime Minister wants to see you. And I said, so what, next week in 10 days? He said, now, you have to take a taxi and come now. He wants you now. Okay, so I sat in a taxi, I went there. This is just to give you a flavor of the energy that everyone talked about. And I came to his office and Jarko Korac, whom some of you may know, who was the deputy prime minister, uh, was there and Zoran said, come in. And literally all the meetings that you had with him would last 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, it was never, there was no wasting of time with Zoran drinking coffee endlessly and uh, gossiping and, and that. And uh, so I said, why, why do you want me? He said, I want you to be my advisor. I said, why is that? He said, there's so much pressure on the prime minister's office and that is because the international community had realized that Kostunica, the president of the country, uh, and the prime minister were completely on different lines. And so the interest in Kostunica fell. There was huge interest on Prime Minister uh, Djindjic. And he said, I need someone to deal with all these uh, delegations, ambassadors that are visiting. I said, so what do I do? He, he, his words were literally, you speak in my name. And I said, that's it? He said, that's it. And so I began literally a, a week later uh, working for him. The energy uh, and, and the, to summarize what he wanted, he knew that we had lost uh, momentum, that uh, we were uh, in a great hurry to catch up on two fronts, on the political 
and the economic, which needs to be underscored. On the political, it was we need to deal with the Hague Tribunal and all the indictees as quickly as possible, and secondly, with Kosovo. He came in every day in the office and he repeated that this was of the essence. Kosovo, because this was the uh, impediment to Serbia's democratic uh, development. And I remember a week before he was killed, we had a meeting with the Fried Friedrich Ebert delegation that came from Berlin, and I remember Gerd Weiskirchen was there, and he took two hours to explain what his policies were, and he said, among other things, I'm reading his Serbian history very thoroughly, and many people can confirm that, and he said, every time I see that Serbia is about to make a step uh, towards democracy, somebody says Kosovo. No, we have to deal with Kosovo. So he said, we need to get this out of the way as quickly as possible. And he was determined, and this is why he was not only a pragmatist, but a realist, that Serbia had lost the war, that it chose to fight against NATO. It didn't accept the Rambouille Agreement, and that it had capitulated to NATO and was kicked out of uh, the Serbian state. Army police were kicked out of Kosovo. And then there was a reality of a de facto independence of Kosovo. That was, of course, de jure, not the fact, because UN Resolution 1244 was still there. And obviously, no need to explain why the Hague Tribunal was so important. And that is why he decided with the government, and I stress with the government, because he had a real team. When he appeared, he appeared with his ministers. They were you know, colloquially called the dream team. Some of you uh, may know them, I won't mention the names. But when he announced the arrest of Milosevic, the whole government stood behind him. All, I don't know, 15 people were there. That is very important because there was a sense of purpose of needing to confront the difficult challenges that Serbia had missed during the 90s of, I repeat, the catastrophic regime of Milosevic. And there has been this revisionism, as some, some have, have mentioned. The economic side is equally important. He repeatedly said we need to privatize the economy as quickly as possible, because if we don't overpass 50% of privatization, we will slide back into bad old habits of state ownership. So a lot of his effort was put in that direction. And uh, so he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, spare himself to go out to the people, to society, and take his message. On a trip that we did to Brussels, uh, to the European Union in November of 2002, there was a meeting of the Business Council of the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe today, South, uh, uh, the Regional Cooperation Council, which was led by someone whom you all know, Erhard Busek. And Erhard introduced him, and Gingic gave a big speech on the importance of regional cooperation. And the sentence that stuck with me, he said, we are only, we as individual countries, are only relevant in the world economy as a region of 50 million people, whereby, of course, he included Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece. And so he was convinced that we have to work regionally to uh, re-establish ties with all the neighboring countries uh, that were part of the Yugoslav wars. And he did a lot in that direction, but also in, in the neighborhood uh, with, with Hungary, with Romania, with Bulgaria and others, and obviously with the US and uh, with the European Union. He made a trip to the United States and then he wrote a few months before his death, letters to the leaders of the world about the need to resolve the Kosovo issue because there was resistance. People were saying it's not time, and he was convinced that it was too late already to go in that direction. The result, of course, of the assassination, and needless to say, we need to repeat it, he was killed by the remnants of the Serbian state, of Milosevic's state, of the police forces. All these people who are serving long-term prison sentences of 40 years uh, were all members of the secret services, of the uh, intelligence services, and of the police. And that is, I think, someone, something that we need to, to remember. And thus, that was one of the reasons why people were surprised, because he had made 
a deal with some of these people on October 5th because he wanted to avoid bloodshed. In that regard, he was the pragmatist that he was and he was ready to speak proverbially to the devil. His mantra was, as most of you know, he said, if you need to eat a frog, eat it immediately. If you need to eat many frogs, eat the biggest one first. And he did. He arrested Milosevic with the Serbian government as prime minister and delivered him to The Hague. Thank you, Ivan, very much for this interesting introduction and for this elaboration of how it was actually back in the days with, with his government and what were the main points of his political side and government. So let's now uh, go to Sofia Mandic. Sofia Mandic is a lawyer and human activist in Belgrade and she is working at the Judicial, Judicial Research Center in Belgrade. So maybe Sofia, we can start with you a bit about, you know, this, uh, what was Jinjit's role, uh, even mentioned uh, the war crimes and Sloboda Milosevic to the tribunal in The Hague. So maybe to elaborate about his, first about his role as, a, as the guy and the person, the first one who introduced those measures to put the war criminals in the right place. Thank you, thank you, Luca. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for being here, for being interested for, for this issue, for, uh, um, for political situation in Serbia and our future, as, as we heard. I think that's, that's a good uh, point of view, right? We, we have to discuss the future, definitely. Uh, we see uh, that the, the current situation is not really happy. You, you mentioned that, and we, we heard that from our colleagues from Belgrade. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for organizing this, this panel and this event. Um, I'm coming from Belgrade. I came this morning really early. Uh, and I actually, uh, when I talked to Luca um, uh, generally about what, are, uh, what is my perspective on Jindic's legacy, I, I agree uh, with Mr. Vevoda that actually his um, determination to open up this Pandora box about the war crimes is one of the, his, his biggest legacy for Serbian society. Um, and I think that we are discussing this issue in the right place because the uh, International Int Institute for Peace um, uh, is really symbolic, it's, it's, it's quite a symbolic place to, to uh, dis discuss this issue because I think that Jinic was uh, in, uh, uh, in, in all these activities related to extradition of um, accused uh, citizens of Serbia to ICTY and uh, adopting uh, domestic laws special, specialized for uh, uh, prosecuting war crimes and um, uh, many other things that, that were done on that path of um, trying to, to, to discuss war, war crimes in Serbian society. Uh, um, he, was, he was in a way peace activist, right? So he, he, he didn't do that just because he wanted to um, uh, finish some international obligations of Serbia. Uh, later on, we, we could hear that from uh, Prime Minister Kostunica and some other Serbian politicians that actually cooperation with, with The Hague and this, um, uh, and this issue of war legacy is actually only Serbian, um, it's Serbian international obligation. But Jinjic was the only one who actually approached this issue in really uh, uh, sincere way, and uh, I, I prepared uh, prepared here uh, uh, some some of uh, the uh, a part of his opening statement in 2001 uh, when he talked about war crimes in national assembly. And before that, I just want to emphasize, although Mr. Vevoda uh, mentioned mentioned that briefly, uh, Zoran Djinic was in power effectively two and a half years. Since uh, January uh, 2001 until his assassination in uh, March of 2003. Uh, so, uh, in terms of his legacy and his influence to Serbian politics and, and Serbian society, we should compare that to some uh, other numbers. For example, the fact that Mr. Uh, uh, Slobodan Milosevic was in power for 10 years, that Vojislav Kostunica was in power uh, almost eight years with some interruptions, that um, Boris Tadic was in power also for eight years, and that Aleksandar Vucic, our current president, is in power for 11 years. So when we, ha we have those numbers compared to this two and a half, you can, you can see uh, that there was really uh, 
uh, Jinch ha had uh, really uh, um, not so many time to 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 accomplish what what he uh, what he wanted and um, all, all those issues that are still um, huge and open for Serbian society, such as relations with uh, um, uh, our neighbors and, and EU and so on and so on. So related to to the war crimes, I will tell you what what he said in two thousand and one. One of the first priorities of this government is facing our past, mainly the most severe criminal acts, killing people for political reasons. Everyone who committed crimes against humanity, against civilians, who killed women and children must face, ju must face justice. And you will see uh, uh, that no, nobody else in Serbian political um, uh, history after him uh, said those words in the National Assembly. Everybody else were just trying to avoid the issue. And I think that uh, this, uh, this attitude, attitude of, of his was part of his beliefs, but I also think that um, it was related to his German education also, that he knew what happened in Germany and uh, that this um, resistant to, uh, resistance to, to um, facing war crimes were, was quite long and he wanted to, to find a shortcut, I would say. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I said that he actually started the cooperation, uh, and Mr. Vevoda said that he started cooperation uh, with, um, with the ICTY uh, in, a, in a, such a big manner with, with uh, extradition of uh, Slobodan Milosevic only six months after he uh, he came into power, actually five five it, uh, five months. It was in June 2001, uh, uh, and uh, this cooperation with ICTY ended in 2000, uh, 2011 uh, when Radko Mladic was was um, finally there. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, Jinji started this. He was killed in 2003, but this, this uh, process was still going on. And despite um, the, the uh, change of regimes and change of, some of the politicians were really against the cooperation with, with ICTY, but he, he really, like, he set the path and it was impossible to, to, to go back. Uh, and except, uh, this huge legacy that I, I will, uh, I think it will, um, that in the in the future and maybe now after 20 years we can maybe see a little bit more how important it was, and I think it will be more and more important important in the future. I will say just maybe a few more words about uh, Zoran Jinjic um, as I see him. Uh, I was in high school when he was killed, and of course, uh, as many other Serbians, I know the place where I was, as, as you know. Uh, I was preparing to go to school uh, on that day. Uh, so who was he? I think he was uh, a deep thinker, a, a really rare person who is a deep thinker on philosophical level, on sociological level, on political level, but still, uh, so operational, so pragmatic, so 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 um, able to organize people and to motivate them. I think this is really really rare in politics, not only in Serbia but generally worldwide. Um, I think he and in Serbia there is a saying also that he's still the livest Serbian uh, politician, although he's not physically alive for 20 years. So he's. That, that's how people perceive him, I, I, and I would, I would agree with that. Uh, and uh, I think that he's also, uh, so he was a deep thinker, but he had uh, this ability to see ahead. And uh, I was really surprised when I saw that he, uh, in 1988, I think in, his, in one of his books that he wrote be before he entered the politics, he, for example, said for Yugoslavia that, he, that the Yugoslavia is a candle burning on both ends. On one end is the nationalism, so the nationalism is eating Yugoslavia, and on the other side, it's this really strict, uh, non-democratic regime, uh, um, which is actually uh, not, 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 not giving people uh, political freedoms. So, and of course, just, just a few years later, we know what happened and uh, where this, um, this characteristics of, of Yugoslavia led. So, to conclude, um, I hope you will have some, some questions. 
Um, I think I would be more positive than my colleagues from Belgrade. Um, uh, of course, I don't see uh, some uh, some happy uh, political moments right now in Serbia, but I think that the new political generation, not only in partisan terms, but new political generation in, in terms of society, I'm, I'm talking about my generation and people between, for example, 30, 35, and 50, let's say so, I think they would be, uh, that they're, they're ready to, like, they're ready to take back, take back that, that path that was violently, uh, um, uh, it, was, it was stopped violently into, in, in 2003. And I personally see in my country and in my city more people of new political generation that are ready to follow that path more than some other nationalistic or, or um, uh, path uh, that, that we already tried with, with Alexander Vucic also. Thank you, Sofia. Um, so now let's go to our next speaker. It's Alida Vracic. Uh, she is the executive director of uh, the Populari Think Tank. So Alida, thank you very much that you came to our institute and that you are willing to participate in this panel. Let us maybe start with the transition, because as the title of this event says, it's also about the transition. It's not only about Zoran Djindjic, but also about the transition process which started with him. Um, what does transition mean for the region after the collapse of Yugoslavia? And what role did Djindjic play as a leader in this transition? And how can we maybe learn from those failures, what happened after Jinji's death, so that we can apply them to fulfill, finally, this transition in our region, if it is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for coming. Um, my perspective is somewhat different because I come from another part of the region. I come from Sarajevo. At the time, Jinji was in the office and then assessed, I was in my, in my mid-20s. I was a young lawyer, and I was just about to start a job at the war crimes chamber, which I think is significant uh, because we do talk about legacies and we do talk about the past and, and courage to face with the past. And even back then, I mean, Bosnia was recuperating from that horrible war. Um, and we have been closely observing what's happening, obviously, in the region. And... Serbia is the largest country of the region. It was always of a, of a specific kind of relation with, with Bosnia in, in that sense. And I also, at, when I started working at the war crimes chamber, which was part of the tribunal, sorry, which was part of the tribunal in Bosnia, only then realized really what was going on and what's the severity of the crimes that have been committed. And I think back then I understood how difficult the process will be not in terms of only you know, pursuing democratic processes and rebuilding institutions and you know, pushing for media freedoms, but this peace building process as such, reconciliation process as such, is gonna be very cumbersome, extremely, extremely lengthy process. And what really struck me watching these videos now is that I have counted 25 times people mentioned vision and 10 times they mentioned symbol. Because I think this is exactly what matters for the transition process that we all embarked on 30 years ago. With some success, with little success, moderate success. Because if you ask any person in the region, and this is more than Serbia, this is Bosnia, this is Albania, this is Kosovo, other countries, where we stand at the moment, I don't think there is a single person who is fully satisfied with, with how the process has, has been happening, when, where the transition has led us so far. And these are the elements of what, what Jinjic was basically uh, putting forward, the economic pillar, extremely important one. There has been so much work uh, uh, done on this topic, and I think it really matters, because the whole idea of the transition was to put us in convergence with the EU standard, meaning that the countries of the Western Balkans will eventually come to the standard of the EU, that we will live the, with the same standard as citizens of the EU same salaries or approximately same salaries, uh, same abilities to travel, to work, and to be mobile. 
very little in, on, that, on that front has happened. Because on average, growth that we had in the past 30 years has been very, very moderate, 3 to 4% of GDP, while all the country reports of the World Bank, if you look at them closely, project that only 6 or 7 or 8 would actually take us somewhere. And they even say that would take us somewhere in 60 years' time. So imagine whole generations living half of the century waiting for something to happen. This is for most of them transition really translates to. And then there is of course accountability and transparency and all these democratic things that we, we kind of talk about very much in, in abstract but bottom line is that you know people should trust their judiciary. People should be able to access services, and should, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be forced to bribe anyone for it. And again, this is where transition um, hasn't really delivered for us because if you just look at the reports from from you know, Transparency International or any other international organization that actually does these indexes, people are less trusty of their governments, of media freedoms are being suppressed. Just as we speak in one part of Bosnia, in Republika Srpska, there is about to be um, a change in, in the law that defamation will b become a part of the criminal law where journalists won't be able to actually write about anyone or uh, expose their, their, any of their details. And this is very, very um, clear message to everyone who wants to, to, to try something. So I think in, in terms of what, what happened in Serbia, Ginger's assassination was a huge setback for democracy that has been felt through the, the entire region. If you look at the regional cooperation, another pillar that, that Gingrich was insisting on, because he did say that uh, only as a region we matter. Um, regional cooperation is extremely fragile. Every time we make one step forward, we make two steps back. And this is what the current elites are living off. This, this, is, this is really convenient for them. And this is, this is, I think, another point where transition hasn't really delivered. We can talk about how that can be changed. We can talk about the factors that that uh, that basically influenced uh, such such slow progress. Uh, partly, it has been because the European Union has been uh, very much uh, sort of all over the place and 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 often changing the rules, but also there were crises. There was an economic crisis. There was a refugee crisis. There was COVID. There were so many things that actually were interrupting this transitional path that, that uh, the region has, um, has been experiencing. At the same time, within the European Union, you have countries that are very much, uh, very much disturbing factors on its way. And of course, in that constellation, you have other countries coming into the coming into the uh, into the place: Russia, Turkey, Gulf states. Um, you know, there there are other actors that are interested in the region, but not in the same way with the same vision that we're we're discussing here. So I guess to conclude, it's 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 really about the it's about the desert, but less of a desert, but the, this third step with, with what, what happens next. Because none of us can live in the future. We live only now and we can perceive only now. But we can set our goals. I mean, no project is successful without an exit plan. So we need to set a goal. We need to have that vision. We need to change our language. We need to change our model of working. We need to offer uh, a, a clear roadmap for people in the region um, in, order to, in order for them to stay even. Because as you know, many people are leaving the region because they simply want to be closer to the Europe. And one way to be closer to Europe is to go to Europe. And the other option is to wait endlessly and you really don't know what the game plan is. So we need to change something and that something um, really needs another visionary, another Jinjic, another, you know, every single country in the region, I would argue, had that momentum. I remember Bosnia that is always perceived as a failed state. If you look at the Twitter today, yesterday, 10 days ago, Bosnia is always on the verge of new conflict, apparently. Um, 
But I remember times, and they, they were the, the approximately same times in 2000, early 2000, when Bosnia was on a, good, on a good path. There were really visionaries in the office. There were people coming from abroad who were willing to work without salary, just to work on the European integrations. I remember government's offices full of maps of what the EU is about. They were not ashamed not to know, they wanted to know what this is about, what are the processes, how this works, what comes next, who is going to do it. There were ministries aligned to actually deliver on these things. And then the, the momentum was lost. And every country, if you look at it very carefully, probably had this momentum. So it's, it's really up to us how to to, to, to sort of rethink this a little bit, maybe even philosophically, but more of a, you know, to, to, from, a, from a point of, of crafting a clear roadmap of how to revive this legacy, how to revive these important pillars, and how to basically move ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alida. Um, let's proceed with Hannes Svoboda. Hannes Svoboda is the president of the International Institute for Peace, but he was also for many, many years a member of the European Parliament and the president of the Social Democrats in the European Parliament. So, Hannes, from your perspective, from the European perspective, because we have heard a lot about the Euro European Union, it is obviously connected with the transition process, with the democratization of, of the region. So, from your perspective, what does transition mean for the region and how does the EU look upon the transition processes in the region? Because it seems to me and to, to other people also that many would say, especially in Serbia, the EU kind of makes it take on the stabilocracy and not on the democracy. So maybe to elaborate a bit on this. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Luca, for organizing and bringing people here together and those are the interviews. Um, I think this is a, a very important subject and I still don't have enough answers or um, could not lead the way out. When I joined the European Parliament in, in 96, in beginning from 97, I was vice chair of the South, uh, delegation for South Eastern Europe. The first visit was by chance uh, in spring uh, 97 to Kosovo, where I saw not only somebody who has been just uh, brought dead from the prison, but also met the Serb uh, representatives, and I saw that the Kosovo will never be solved by the Serb authorities of that time. And later we met uh, people from Otpor, of the student revolution, B92 and others, and we were very hopeful that this revolution, this transition will take place. When we met uh, the first time uh, Mr. Kostunica, our hope was very much damped, uh, because we saw that this is a difference to Milosevic, whom I never met, uh, thankfully, but it was not the big step forward we expected. And uh, very soon, I think one of the big mistakes has been also on the media sector. Very soon we saw that the different media have been purchased by European uh, magnets uh, and uh, were going not in the direction of democracy, democratic media, democratic opinion, but very much on, on the way of just earning some money, going to the um, side of uh, the boulevard, and not bringing from the media sector at least a contribution to democracy and so on. Now later, of course, when we met Cincic, uh, it was much, uh, you know, to our, to our joy that there was somebody who really had an interest. Of course, he had to respect the national interest. He was a national, uh, was a politician of Serbia. Uh, but he had to fight with many internal opposition, as you mentioned. I met him the last time in, in Brussels, we went to the cafeteria in the European Parliament, maybe it was on the November day, what, what you mentioned. I don't know if this was the last visit. But um, he was quite tired. And he told me why he was tired. Of course, you know, if you're, if you're a prime minister and go back and forth and all the trips, but it was also this opposition in the country he felt against it. 
Because at that time, for me, there were, of course, the old uh, Milosevic guys, you mentioned them. There was this Kostulica who only made problems uh, with all these legalistic uh, uh, interpretations and motivations. We cannot do that. We cannot bring the people outside the country and so on. But he didn't do anything to bring them to the courts inside the country. He just didn't want to have any kind of this kind of really democratic transition besides having elections. Um, and of course, with killing Cincic, uh, uh, many of the hopes were killed and the transition towards democracy was at least um, interrupted. It's uh, read and mentioned of different other countries. It's interesting, tomorrow I go to, to Hungary to a, a conference on, on, the, on the Western Balkans, another country where revolution or dem democratic transition was just interrupted. By chance, I travel a lot now, and on Saturday I go to Tunisia when the same thing happened. You have the situation that we do not think enough about the forces opposing democratic transition. We always have, uh, think, okay, revolution, transition to democracy, wonderful. But there are so many people who don't want transition to democracy because they lose. The people of the secret services you mentioned, they don't want it. And the people of the maf different mafia groups, they don't want it. Uh, people who still belong to the old guard, like in Tunisia to Ben Ali or to Milosevic in a new country, they don't want it. And um, I think the European Union did not do enough in order to think about to, how to support people who are, of course, not from one day to another, say, full democracy, Kosovo is independent, everything, because they would be killed even, even earlier than, than uh, Gingic was killed. But to think about, I don't know why the Secret Service, for example, the US Secret Service, did not know more about what is happening or was happening in, in Serbia that day. Because normally, uh, they do, do know quite a lot if they are interested in preventing these kind of attacks. Not that they were part of that. No, I, I am not, uh, uh, you know, um, adherent to these theories about uh, whatever has of connections between different secret services. Also on the on the media side, I already mentioned why did European Union not develop another kind of support for open, democratic-oriented media, including even, it's not enough now to fight against Russian media in our uh, different countries because of the war. Already before the war, there was a strong influence of Russian media and uh, even of mere economic interest of Western media just to buy some of these uh, companies and then promote even, uh, also in Serbia, promote even very, very ugly propaganda, supporting Mr. Vucic, but not supporting democracy and, and democratic values. So I think, um, basically, not being too long, I think we should much more, all of us, in on, at the universities, at uh, the different political parties at the European Union more think about what are the different effects in all, in all the countries the same which are blocking the transition towards democracy even if it started already uh, how to block rather more the forces opposing democracy opposing democratic development in all the different fields and I think it's not enough to spend small money on some NGOs who do some valuable work. It must be a much more comprehensive concept, uh, which is uh, supporting democracy and opposing the forces of uh, um, blocking democratic development. Uh, maybe we are sometimes too strict, sometimes we are not enough strict. Um, and then gets the impression of uh, uh, rather supporting Mr. Vucic. And it was also clear now in, not a new subject, but 
when we saw the development in the past, even now today, some of these undemocratic leaders get a lot of support, financial support, political support, and now even we have in the European Union a commissioner who is coming from a country, uh, Hungary, Hungarian government, uh, which has no interest on democratic development, who is cooperating with Mr. Vucic on many economic and political issues, uh, a commissioner who is not drawing attention to the failures of promoting democracies or the failures of uh, openness concerning uh, media sector, and that is a disaster. And therefore, I'm very happy, but uh, it will not, of course, be a, a great outcome that European Parliament or some European Parliament asks the Commission how they can accept the policies of the present Enlargement Commissioner. Uh, because that is not a Commissioner who is promoting democracy, but on the contrary. So there's a lot still to do for us all in order to think about how the how stopping democracy can be stopped, how the interruption of uh, transition can be stopped, and to, new, to find new paths and new ways uh, to promote democracy, as just has been mentioned by all the speakers before me. Thank you very much, Hannes. Um, we have heard a lot about vision. We have heard a lot about energy. Uh, we have heard a lot about also media and what media, what role does media play in the transition process. But maybe for our panelists, before we proceed with the Q and A, maybe for our panelists to to say like two, three sentences, how to come to the vision, how to create a new vision, how to come to this new energy. So maybe. Just two, three sentences short, how do you see it in the future? It would be interesting, I also think, for our audience to elaborate more on that. I'll try my best. <laughs> um, well, first of all, again, it was very important to hear the younger generation of people who are either in politics or in the civic sector. Um, and I think, as, as Sofia said, you know, there is a new generation out there, and I think they have understood from the mistakes and we do have an opposition in the parliament, in the Belgrade City Council, which is very important. So there are new energies. Uh, democracy takes time and it is very complex. Our friend and, and colleague uh, Klaus Hoffe, the sociologist, early on in the transition wrote about the simultaneity problem. You're juggling 20 balls at the same time because as opposed to the Latin American and South European transitions in Spain and Portugal and Greece, we didn't even have a capitalist economy. So you're reforming economy, politics, culture, secret services, education, everything at the same time. And there are bound to be balls that you're juggling that fall to the ground. You know, when people ask me, what was your experience in government? That was the only thing that I learned. I mean, I had studied, I'd written on transition, but being inside the machine, you realize that simply there are only 24 hours in a day and some things will go wrong. Gingrich, that's why he realized you need to move fast. The other thing that's important is institution building. He was well aware that trying to build democratic institutions, the division of powers, checks and balances are very important. That's where the backsliding in our countries and in my country, Serbia, has happened. There has been an erosion of institutional democratic life. Hopefully now with the parliament and these things, we're slowly regaining some of that. The media are crucial because pluralism is the name of the democratic game. One, respect for the opposition. That's a key tenet of democracy and unfortunately we don't see very much of that. And secondly, you need to have an open media space so that people are confronted with a variety of views on things. And so it is in that plurality of views that the vision occurs. You need not go back to Machiavelli to understand that the society is conflict and conflict in a positive sense, the confrontation of views. And if you don't have that, if you have a monologue, if you have an overwhelming presence of one point of view, I think society is, it's difficult to move, to move forward. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, well, 
Well, I would agree with Mr. Raybaud on everything, and uh, I would just, maybe it's answer to your question, but also comment to what Mr. Swoboda said and um, uh, about opposing democratization. Uh, definitely, it's, uh, I just want to say that it's not so bad as it seems from the outside. Uh, for example, in, to in 2012, Mr. Nikolic from Serbian Progressive Party won uh, uh, president pre presidential elections for, I think he gained like 60,000 uh, votes more than Mr. Tadic. So it's less than one uh, vote per polling station, for example. So Serbia is more of a victim of, of its own citizens' apathy at some, some uh, historical moments. Uh, and though that, that historical moment, I think, it, it was also related to Zoran Djinic, who, who didn't gain enough support when he needed that support. So I think that's, that's our problem that we should deal with. Like, when we have the chance, we, we should grab that chance. And uh, I think those retrograde uh, or um, um, uh, anti-modernization or anti-democracy forces in Serbia, they, they are existing, but they're not so powerful as they seem from the outside. It's just the fact that the ruling party now, uh, as I said, they're they are 11 years in power. They grabbed the media, they grabbed the elections. Elections are not free anymore. So they're controlling those pro processes and then they're weighing the, with their results and saying like, ha, oh, we have 60% of support. That's not the case. That's not the, 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 true, uh, the true will of the people. So I think that uh, uh, things are m much simpler than they, they seem. Uh, I really believe uh, that, that the old generation of politicians, I mean uh, Vucic, I mean Dacic, I, I, I mean all of the politicians who were in power during 90s, they cannot bring change. And I think that EU is mistaking, uh, actually making a huge mistake and made a huge mistake when they decided uh, that they will believe the old guys will bring the change, right? So I think it's, it's actually, the solution is related to biology a little bit. So they have to leave and the new people have to come and the new people are much smarter and as Mr. Weboda said, uh, we, we were witnessing a lot of history in like, I was born in 1986 and I saw too much stuff for my, yeah, yeah, I mean, and the bombing and the killing of uh, Mr. Djindic and all that, like too much history for, for my 36 years. So I think we learned a lot and um, I think the future is, is bright, brighter than it seems right now. Well, that's yeah. a positive note. So let's proceed with Alida. Um, I mean, this is a one million dollar question, right? Um, that you're asking how 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 one moves on and how what's what's the silver lining? I think it's it's a it's it's double facet basically. Um, on one hand, we need to make sure that the EU understands that poor countries and people living in poverty cannot think about democracy. So we need to make sure that we. Um, catch up in a way with the European um, sort of economic train. That's the first thing. Second thing is that power really truly can come within. And what I mean by that is that people are able to exert this pressure um, and put pressure on politicians. We have seen that a couple of times. And when they have a clear goal, when they know what's at stake, when they know what they can gain, they really can mobilize around that. And it's not, you know, some generation, but throughout generations. Um, I think we need to change the language. We, it's just, we, we, we speak in, in terms that are just elusive. They're not e easy to understand. They're not um, easy to pin. They're not easy to, to, to sort of translate into something concrete. And when I say we, I, I mean, European um, European countries often speak very very uh, difficult languages with with the accession countries. Also, we should definitely put um, future into the hands of young people, but not 
But be, should, you should be careful about that too, because we have seen generations of young people in the Western Balkans that are not necessarily different from what we have seen before. They're actually really carbon copies of those that we have seen before, even if not more radical. So it's not as simple. Um, and I mean, again, we need to find um, where, where we want to, where what we want to achieve, and when we want to do it. I mean, this is all about exit strategies. This is about the. I, I mentioned it at the beginning, and I'm going to mention it again. No good project without ed exit strategy uh, has ever been seen in, in any of the of development world. So unless you know what you want, I mean, a good example is the Office of the High Representative in Bosnia, which is a horrible example, but it's in, in, in this way is a good example. That is one thing without any exit strategy. And it perpetuates itself, it creates problems uh, uh, further on, and, and we're talking about 20 plus years now. And if we continue that way, I mean, with, with other things that we're doing, with all the democratic processes that we're interested in, I think we're, we're just doomed. So we need to find a somewhat more clear path and give, give opportunity to those that we haven't heard before, that are not necessarily in our circles. Because we often assume well, how they feel and how they think. And we're often very afraid of conflicts and other sort of opinions and, and, and worldviews, but we shouldn't be, really. Thank you. Thank you, Lida. Hannes? Yeah, very briefly, I think what you mentioned about the apathy, that's a, that, that's a very important issue. We saw it also not only in countries like uh, Serbia, but in Britain, the vote on, on Brexit was the result also of apathy, apathy especially also of young people. So I'm a bit in between you two with the skepticism. I'm not so sure that the young automatically uh, will turn around uh, the course of the different countries, but of course they have to have the chance. The real issue is how to, to bring more positive emotion into, into their life in order to be able to change something. And here, um, unfortunately, the opposition parties in, in um, Serbia were not very successful in the past, hopefully now with a lot of young uh, people in, in the parliament, they can work in the parliament, but those outside, that of course, unfortunately, still the rules in the parliament are not uh, very uh, positive for, for an open discussion. Here also the European parliament wanted to mediate, but failed in a bit, not, it was not their, their mistake perhaps. So I think uh, very important is in our democracy and uh, for promoting democracy to overcome the apathy of many people who see, well, they are just quarreling. I don't care and about what they do. I just do my job and that's it. At the end, maybe they cannot even do their job because the economy, economy or the whole political development is going in the wrong direction. Thank you, Hannes. So now I would like to proceed to the Q&A and to the questions from the audience. I hope that there are many questions from the audience since it is a really interesting topic. So please don't be shy and raise your hand. Let's, let's start with Dennis. Uh, it's on. Good evening, my name is Dennis Miskic. I'm a journalist for the Austrian daily Kuria. And um, reading the news this morning, I found out Dushman Krismanovic, one of the people involved in the assassination, was released from prison today. And I couldn't help but take this symbolically and kind of ask myself what is, not what is left of Ginger's legacy. I mean, we've been discussing this now for the past hour, but who right now in Serbia is truly representing the democratic spirit and, and vision he had back in the early 2000s. And considering, I mean, the undermining of the democratic institutions that has been going on over the past decade, really, um, what real chances would a politician like Jinjic back then have in today's Serbia? Thank you. Thank you. Let's proceed with the gentleman. <clears throat> Well, concerning the hope uh, set into the youth, um, I remember these groups um, 
we were, which were mentioned, like Otpor or B92 or the Center for Polit Political Decontamination or so. So it would be interesting for me, uh, what happened to this generation, to these people, these maybe a few hundred or thousand people who were active in, this, uh, in the, the early uh, years of the new um, century? Uh, can, can you give a kind of collective biography of, of these people? Are, have they left the country? Did they stay? If they stay, what are they doing? Thank you. Let's collect some more questions. Yes. Kramer, uh, Institute of the Danube Region. Um, uh, Mr. Svoboda, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, uh, Russia was much more effective in, in influencing media and so on, uh, and the EU is not so active. Is there any movement now, finally, in, in the European Union or Commission uh, to have more uh, openness to, to uh, trying inf to influence uh, not only governments but also the people and in what way possibly? Thank you. Yes, the lady. Okay. Um, regarding economy, economy uh, which configurations would um, support developments towards democracy, towards uh, a good relation to the Re European Union, uh, getting into each other. Um, would it be necessary to loosen the relationships to Chinese and Russian companies? What Thank you think? very much. I'll start here. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, a very interesting debate uh, today, um, but I wanted to take up the word about reconciliation. And I think uh, it may be a part of the democratization process, but I see for the time being that it is really stuck. Whether Jinjic himself would be a good model for uh, a process of reconciliation, I'm not so sure, but that is another question. But I would like to hear from you, because I think without reconciliation, uh, also democratization will not really be possible. Let's maybe stop here for a second, and then we proceed with the second round of the questions. So let's start with the first question about the suspect which was released today from prison after 20 years of having spent in prison. He was one of the, of the suspects who was uh, detained for, for the assassination which happened 20 years ago, so maybe let's start with Sofia, I assume. Yeah, uh, I think it's Dusan uh, Krasmanovic, and he was, uh, he was a helper to the main perpetrators. So he was on the, let's say, he, he was on the margins of that group uh, organized, and that group was actually a joint enterprise of organized crime and some uh, leftovers of the Milosevic's deep state, as, as Mr. Avod already said. So uh, I wouldn't be so um, uh, worried about his release because, as I said, he was on the margins of the of the group, and his sentence was was um, not so long as other our other gained 35, 40 years of of prison. And the interesting thing is that actually. My professional journey, in a way, uh, started um, uh, by following that trial in the special uh, chamber of uh, higher court in Belgrade. And I uh, met Ser uh, Sergei Popovic, the mm, lawyer of Djinic's family there, and he was actually my first uh, mentor in my professional life. So I, I remember quite well of the process, and I, don't be worried about his release. Maybe. Uh, some dates can be like suspicious, like why now, why, why today, but it's, it's not a big issue in terms of 
um, uh, in, in terms of our relation to that assassination. Uh, who is your other question was like who is the successor if I understood well like in Serbian politics and in the interviews we heard a lot like the vision the myth the positive myth uh, the the um, the wish to own Jinjic's vision and I would like to see in the future of course I would like to see his ideas I would like to see, to see people reading what he left behind him and to, to hear what he, he was saying. But I would like to see a little, see a little bit uh, of like political de decentralization, if I can say so. Like we don't need the one, like we don't need new Djindjic. We just need enough smart people who are supporting uh, ideas of, uh, political ideas of 21st century. So I, I wouldn't point out to anybody and like, uh, give him, give him, giving him or her the crown. Uh, I just think it should be more people, more than one, because Djidjic ended up uh, as, as he did because he was only one, right? Uh, so, uh, but in terms of some movements, I, I think that the Democratic Party is struggling. Uh, they are doing their best in, in, court, in current cir circumstances also Nedavimo Beograd, also some local movements. Uh, so there are people who are, who are going in that direction, but there is no, the, you know, we don't have the king. And, and I, I, I don't think we, we should have uh, the king in the future. Uh, and uh, just a brief about Otpur people and other involved in this uh, uh, rally in 2000. Uh, some of them uh, emigrated. After, after this event in 2003, and some of them just went, you know, um, in, just became passive, became passive that they, they, um, they saw that, their, their, that the, the fight was useless and they just, you know, uh, went back to the dark in, in terms of public life, right? So, uh, but, uh, per my understanding, many of them left the country. Thank you. And also, we should note that many of them, or a certain group of those people who were supporters or worked with Jinjic, are right now working with the current government. So we also have the people who just changed the politics. Not all, but some of them. Maybe Ms. Yeah, uh, Mr. Vivoda, yeah. I add a few things to what uh, Sofia um, said. Please grab uh, the mic. Um, yeah, some, some left the country, and in fact, many, especially of the Otpor people, are promoting democracy around the world. Uh, they used the experiences of NGO activism, etc., and are working for various international uh, agencies in Africa and Asia, and uh, so they've used their, their knowledge well. Uh, quite a few of them went into business. Uh, which is also interesting, uh, and some remained uh, loyal to, to their you know, political leanings, so we, we find them there. Uh, who inherits them to the list? Uh, I would add definitely uh, human rights NGOs, investigative journalists. We have several organizations which are doing really good work in the absence, unfortunately, of a public prosecution. Uh, that is not good. And I would add that some of you who follow our situation in Serbia closely saw that two public prosecutors were uh, relieved of their duties. And there's, there's been a genuine protest against because the judiciary is very weak and not really independent. People know that. They're ready to bear a certain level of this. But I think this is the straw that broke the camel's back, the ousting of these two women. And, uh, the, and that is to, to, what, uh, to the question about is Jinjic's model of risk reconciliation something to follow? I think it is. He was well aware, and thank you, Sofia, for quoting him. I think it's very important. There was a conference on issues of confronting the past on December 2000. And one, I, if I remember rightly, where we had people like Timothy Garton Ash come, where Alex Borain from South Africa came to talk about the South African uh, experience, and especially in establishing the independence of the judiciary, 
which is crucial in uh, setting up the institutions necessary to confront the past, full well realizing, and this is again where you said the German experience was crucial, it takes a long time. I mean, the monument to the Holocaust in Berlin was built 45 years after what happened. So these things take time, which is no justification not to do the work of reconciliation and much more needs to be done. And I would add, for example, when the bodies of 800 Albanians were found in the police center in Batajnica, Gingis did not hide this. He went and publicly mentioned it, although Kostenica was against revealing these things. So he was not afraid to acknowledge the crimes that were done in the name of the Serbian state, which in no way diminished the victims of Serbs in the various parts of uh, former Yugoslavia. So he was well aware of, of the importance uh, of, of that. Um, the question on, um, on the economy, very, very important one in fact. I mean, to state the obvious, it needs to re be repeated. I like to put it very simply, we are lucky to be in Europe. And the fact that we are a European country helps us a lot. In Serbia, 65 to 70 percent of trade is with the European Union. Chinese and Russian that we talk a lot about are nowhere near the type of economic activity that we do with the European Union. The Prime Minister, uh, Bernavich, I was at a conference in Belgrade just last week. She mentioned that 300,000 jobs in Serbia were created mostly by German, Italian, Austrian, and other investments. So the whole country depends on the West. And that is why I think, if I can add uh, to, to this element of the never-ending transition in Serbia, um, that what President Vucic has done on the positive side is to attract a lot of investments and done job creation. There is sort of talk that we might also be getting a big German car factory. Who knows where this will end, but this is something positive. And uh, to mention uh, Kosovo again, I think that what President Vucic is doing to accept the Franco-German agreement on Kosovo is extremely important. There's a lot of opposition. He is called a traitor. But I think that because Gingic was not able to do 20 years ago what I mentioned at the beginning, we are unfortunately, with two decades later, seeing what probably would have happened then. I think Luca mentioned, and we have this mantra, we never lose an opportunity to lose an opportunity. And we've been doing so for 20 years. And every offer is worse than the one before. So Rambouillet, when you look at what was offered at Rambouillet, was enormous. Uh, Milosevic's main constitutional advisor at the, at the time, uh, Mr. Kutlesic Vladan, died, unfortunately, uh, uh, two years ago. He had the need before dying to give an interview to said we should have accepted uh, Rambouillet. But, you know, a dying man usually needs to say, tell the truth about these things. And so I think that even though President Vucic is being attacked both by ultranationalists and by some people in the opposition, that there's no way forward for Serbia because of the economic, and this is where it links up, Serbia will not survive. Well, you know, when people ask, what is the alternative to the European Union? You know, it's kind of uh, intellectually wrong to say there are no alternatives. Well, yes, there is an alternative. It's self-isolation and the, the, the proverbial eating grass, like Albania did in the 60s, linked to China and building bunkers, thousands of bunkers. That's the alternative. So I think if, if one wants to put a sort of positive uh, spin on some of the uh, uh, geopolitical developments, quote unquote, thanks to Mr. Putin, there's been a realization that Europe has to wake up to its need to help this region move forward and come out of the lethargy of allowing the region to live on even though basically there's no problem with it. No, we have to solve this because it's a European security issue. Thank you, Mr. Vivoda. A leader, yeah, the reconciliation. I yeah, I would like to pick up on that and maybe an economy, which is an interesting one because I, I really think it's crucial. Um, 
It's true what Ivan said, that we are absolutely um, leaning towards the European Union. If you look at the banks that are operating in the region, 80% of these banks are owned by German or, or Italian or Austrian banks. If you look at the, the, the companies that are coming via FDI, this is all European companies. But we have to be careful not to attract any type of companies because what mostly we end up with in the region are the jobs that are paid 300 euros. And this is not something that is desired, and this is definitely not going to take us to the convergence. Uh, in Serbia, uh, luckily, there are other options too, because Serbia is an, an actually a front runner, maybe also European Union, but front runner in terms of um, in terms of IT technologies. And there have been many companies that are actually developing really high quality software attracting many people also from abroad. Um, and this is something that has been uh, happening already for five, six, seven years. And I think this is exactly the type of, of, of sort of uh, well-paid jobs that would attract not only people to stay in Serbia, but also attract people from abroad. Another point there, um, given the, the size of diaspora of the, Europe, of the Western Balkans, which is very large, it's, it's eight to 10 million, we have to st start speaking seriously about diaspora direct investments that are somewhat different from foreign direct investments because when 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 they come you actually have a know-how that stays with you unlike with the FDI so it's 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 there are lots of different options that we haven't i think even investigated as much that could help region uh, sort of catch up in, economically with the rest of Europe as for the reconciliation it's a tricky one. We have done um, all sorts of projects. I've been part of many, many different things since 20 years of transitional justice. A part of the war crimes chamber that I've, I've been working at also had this transitional justice line, and many people have been working on it. Um, the thing is that we not, non, don't necessarily see everything. And what I mean by that is that bottom up, there are things happening. There are, you know, children visiting another children's schools are sort of cooperating. Uh, there are all sorts of programs that, that allow, uh, you know, kids to have very frank, open and very difficult discussions that are basically moving us ahead. At the same time, if we talk about, um, you know, top-down sort of uh, messaging that we're getting at the moment from the region, I think you're right. It, it's it's not where we want to be. I mean, we're still discussing whether Mladic is a hero or he's a war criminal. So that kind of um, you know that that kind of um, sort of narrative certainly doesn't contribute to reconciliation itself. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. There was also a question about the EU. Yeah, uh, briefly. On the economy, much has been said. I think what is important is also do the fight against corruption. Now, we know also in Austria that it is important in our own country, so it's not an issue where we can say you only show to the others. But I think it, this is a very important element. We, we, well, in the extreme, we saw in Russia how uh, this corruption and this mafia structures supporting uh, authoritarian leaders is, is uh, really bad. We see it in Hungary, and we see some connection between Hungary and Mr. Orban and Mr. Vucic also on this issue. So I think fight against corruption is a very important element uh, uh, in promoting uh, transparency in the economy. On the reconciliation, I think, uh, as just has been said, Something is going on. Um, it needs a lot of time, but I think we do not do enough. And uh, especially the European Union should do more on it. Uh, if you look to the budget and look to the, to the decisions of the European Union, what has to be done and what is done, it's not enough. I will have the honor to follow Ehad Busek as president of an institute in, in Saloniki, where we uh, produced these school books. Uh, where we presented different uh, versions, so to ha go against the nationalistic uh, interpretation of uh, historic events. How much are they used? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's not so much. And I think what happened in school, and when we visited uh, the last time also Bosnia-Herzegovina, 
uh, where still they have this kind of separate school or even separate uh, teaching under one roof. And also in Kosovo, you know, what the world, the, the one learn only the Kosovo Albanian history and the other the Serb uh, history. This, this should be stopped. Uh, one should overcome that because that perpetuates this nationalistic orientation, nationalistic views, and is working in a way against reconciliation. But that's not only for Serbia, it's uh, for most of the countries. Um, on the media, unfortunately not, but it is of course very difficult how the EU should uh, promote alternative medias. Now, something should be done. We hope that with the social media things will be better, I doubt, because sometimes even the social media are used to promote uh, very nationalistic tendencies, and they are they are easier to promote it. You know, the negative uh, and the attacks on the others is easier to promote and is much more seen than the positive elements. But I think uh, it's not enough to stop Russian media. Uh, propaganda in our countries, one should think about promoting some alternatives in the social media, maybe also in the print media, and should insist on competition uh, in the media sector, which is important. Now, we had the difficulties inside the European Union when Berlusconi was in Italy, and it was very difficult to convince some of the commissioners or council members in the European Union to do something ag against it, because they said it's not up to the European Union, which formally is true. But nevertheless, I think the media sector is something where democracy cannot thrive without at least competition in the media sector, uh, or freedom to develop uh, media. And I think uh, all those who are for democratic development should think much more what we can do in the media sector in order to promote open ideas. So, just one sentence, and uh, I, I would like to add on, on reconciliation. I think that we have a little bit of, uh, because Alida also said, is Radko Mladic a war, uh, is he a hero or is he a war criminal? That we have this um, dilemma in our societies, right? Uh, both in Serbia and probably in Republika Srpska. But uh, for example, in Serbia in, 2000, in 2020, daily Danas, who is uh, conduct, co conducting um, uh, public opinion research on, on the issue you raised, uh, um, they, conclu they concluded that 85% uh, percentage of people of the general population is against war crime, uh, convicted war crime criminals and accused of war crimes to be in any public position. So that's 85% of, of the Serbian general population. That's, that's the, the situation in the field. And you have then uh, people in power who are, you know, su supporting murals and, you know, um, speaking this and that in the public. So I think that we are a little bit, you know, we have this distorted uh, picture of what's going on and that actually uh, the, the support to the, to, to the old policies and to the war crime um, uh, convicted people is not, is not as, as uh, significant as, as, is, as it seems. Thank you, Sofia. So let's proceed with the last round of questions, and please let's be short so that the answers can also be short. <laughs> if it is possible, if there are any questions, I think you, you, you wanted to pose a question in the last session. Yeah, thank you very much, Florian Arnick from Austrian Foreign Ministry. Um, you were talking about um, the vision uh, to be developed and especially I thought very interesting what uh, Madame Alida said, that transition means reaching the EU standards and uh, people want to be closer to the EU, so you have two options, either you wait or you leave. And I have the feeling that not only in Serbia, but all over Southeastern Europe, the young urban middle class is leaving still in masses. And this is let's say, the, the society group, the group of the, the societal group that you need for transition. You were mentioning, on, and also Ivan said, that now they're being <coughs> promoted new investments, uh, interesting investments, also in the IT sector, you said, 
uh, so to have attractive jobs, to have better salaries, because a salary of 200 euro, you cannot survive in the Balkans neither. But what else can be done in order to keep this young urban middle class layer in the region? Thank you. Some more questions? Yes, there is a gentleman in the middle. Thank you and good evening. And thank you very much for your this, this event. So, in fact, uh, first it's about a remark, um, because you have noticed that uh, many times some words are coming up in, the, in our speeches, as we said before, uh, vision, blah, blah, and so, but also the, the word transition is everywhere. And for me, I have a slight problem, semantically speaking, about this word, because what does it mean, transition? We are all in transition. I am in transition. Everything is, everything, everybody is in transition. So, so for me, this word is quite misleading because with this word, we give the feeling that to the people, to the young people and so, that we are in transition and then we can expect everything and everything. So this is, uh, for me, a wrong word that we should uh, try to avoid. So this is my remark that, of course, uh, calling for your comment. And then the second point is about EU. EU is everywhere. Is, EU is the goal. EU is the objective. EU is the vision. Okay, G uh, the, 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 give me a break, please. The, the EU is okay, but of course the EU has been built by some people just after the Second World War and with uh, some leaders from France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and Belgium, and those leaders took the, the things into account. So it's up now to, your, to the countries in the Western Balkan to do the same, and not to expect everything and anything from the EU. That's fine, okay, the EU is okay, but okay, uh, give me a break, please, and then do, do your job. So thank thank you. you very much. Maybe for the last question, if somebody wants to, to ask a question, I would especially encourage our young students for, from the Political Science University at Vienna, if somebody has a question, we would very much welcome it. Good evening. I'm not a student, but let me ask. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I will be short. I think, <laughs> I hope. Uh, do you think the connection between uh, public position uh, of Serbia in the uh, war rush against Ukraine, uh, if we uh, talk about uh, EU membership and uh, this wish of Serbia or not. Thank you for that. So the position of Serbia on the war in Ukraine, what does the public think about? And has it any influence to your perspectives of EU membership or not? Okay, so um, let's maybe start with Hannes now, so that we conclude in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, uh, very briefly, on, on the emigration, Alina and others will say more on the study on it, but what I, I know and I feel is that there are many reasons not to come back, or at least the many reasons to leave, uh, is also the political system, also the environmental situation, you know more about Sarajevo, the, how the environmental situation is, and the chances. I think many people don't see their chance there are some elements and some um, try to organize some institutions where they will call on emigrees to come back. And I think this is the only way you can do it, like it was done also in Ireland, when they organized uh, and invited people to come back and gave them a possibility to uh, open a business in their own country. And I think more has to be done. but. I think also the general political system, the question of the environment are important as a as an factor of pulling people back into their country, but others will say more. On the transition, I don't understand why it's not so difficult. I mean, transition means from more authoritarian system to more democratic system. Transition means that you give uh, people more chance in the economic field, but also in the political field, to be part of the democratic decision how a country should be run. So I think transition is an important element. Of course, 
not transition back, but transition towards democracy. And there are many studies uh, that it is clear that democratic systems avoid more um, in, in development is more uh, hunger, more poverty. Uh, democratic system uh, give more people a chance to develop their life in a way they want to develop it. So I think it's quite obvious that democracies are not only an abstract element we should strive for, but give people more chance. And therefore, transition towards democracy means more chance. It does not mean everything is solved by from one day to another. So transition, I think, is an important element. To the last question, I think what is important, and this is, uh, we didn't speak too much about it, but um, is that the alternative which Russia is promoting, which Russia is delivering, uh, also to in the Balkan countries, is a vital element of the future of the region of any country. I think it, it must be very clear. Uh, we have difficulties in, in the global, so-called global south to convince countries, India, I don't speak about China, but India, South Africa, Brazil, to condemn the war in Russia. There are many reasons why it is difficult. But it is, is the, the Russian war against Ukraine. But it is not acceptable that in the European, on the European soil, in the countries of the region, we accept that you do, you do have at least an ambivalent attitude towards the Russian uh, war against Ukraine. Because it's not only about a country, it's about a system, it's about an ideology, it's about an attitude. And uh, those countries and those leaders who support Russia's war in Ukraine, or are more or less ambivalent at least, have an ambivalent position towards democracy. It's very clear. And therefore, for me, um, it is a vital issue of discussion between European Union and Serbia. It does not mean that uh, Serbia has to cut all the ties to Russia, but it does mean that Serbia must at least have an attitude on economic sanctions in the way, on, on dealing with Russia in a way what we expect to follow the European line. That's uh, my position at least. Let me pick up on, on immigration um, point. I mean, thank you for raising it. It's it's kind of evident, isn't it? Every time we speak about the region, this, this comes up as, the, as one of the first things. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the numbers, but numbers are quite staggering. I mean, every single country in the region loses approximately one big city every, day, every, every year. So we're talking about anything between 20 and 40,000 people leaving. And, and initially, people started believing, uh, started leaving because they, you know, there were economic factors to it. But more and more, other factors started kicking in, such as pollution, environmental sort of reasons, but also d disillusion with with the with the whole kind of uh, transition process that we're going to get back to. Um, so what what basically that means? That means that um, country not only loses people because you can only do that much with immigration. If you're a small country, there are other countries that will definitely attract your people if they're offering better better conditions. And here I'm referring to Germany, for example, that just recently, like a couple of days ago, announced that every single year, 500,000 new people will be needed in Germany in terms of workforce. That workforce has to come from somewhere. I mean, refugee crisis in 2015 was actually quite convenient for Germany. And if you look at the numbers, quite few of these people have been integrated and they're paying taxes at the moment. Other people, other source that countries such as Germany needs comes from the Western Balkans. It's also very convenient because you're actually not only losing people, but they're, they're taking with themselves thousands and thousands of euros in education because they have been educated, they have been gone to the primary school, secondary school, universities, master degrees, and that has been financed by, the, by, by all these countries in the Western Balkans, and then they go to Germany, they, they learn the language, and they basically find a job. Uh, there are many options, and we should, um, we should 
really uh, be realistic about it because you can do only that much given these uh, these factors. But there are different options that other countries have done. I've been studying Ireland for that matter because it's a really interesting place. It's it's a, it's not as large. It's an island. Uh, many many uh, uh, Irish people left to to to, um, to America, to Australia, and elsewhere. And they started attracting attracting them back uh, by offering different types of jobs, 21st century jobs. That was the first thing. Second thing is that they offered a somewhat more flexible arrangements, meaning circular migration. So you can sort of live and enjoy benefits of your job somewhere in Western Europe, but you can still come back and, and contribute one way or the other. If you're a professor, you will come back and you will have a lecture. If you're a doctor, you can have operations. There are all sorts of different modalities how one does that. Eventually, you have to create conditions for these people to, to want to stay. This is the ultimate thing. And then we go back to the economics, because economics is, is, is really the core of it, because people need to see that they can, that, that they can be part of the, 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 you know, the, the, the same sort of family as the European family. I think culture is also a great, great um, sort of neglected point, because people do want to enjoy the same cultural sort of life uh, in their own countries in order to, to stay there. This is, this is an, an ex extremely important element for young people. Environment as such and how much we care about it. These are all elements that, that come with the transition and that gets me to your point what the transition means. For me, transition is basically exiting the periphery which is culturally deprived where you don't have as many museums that you want, as many exhibitions that you want, as many media pluralism that you want. It's, it's the economics, it's social, and going to the core, going, going closer to where you actually can find that when you travel and when you, when you see it, when you travel abroad. This is the, the, the decision that, that basically translates very simply, and then, within you have all these reforms that we have talked about for two hours now that basically entail the entire process. Thank you, Alina. Okay, now we're just starting to have fun and we have to leave. Uh, so uh, so um, on, the, on people leaving, uh, I would maybe uh, try to bring a little bit um, of different perspective. Um, my, for example, my daughter is eight. And she goes to school where uh, uh, parents are already saying to their children, you should leave this country. Like, you know, as soon as possible, you should leave. We are talking about um, children who, are, who just entered the elementary school. Uh, so this, this um, how to say, this, I would say openly pressure from, from, the, from, from parents to, to like uh, pushing uh, um, your own children to leave because there is no perspective and you, and you in the same time you're not opening, um, uh, you're not supporting your own child to, to, to see that there is some alternatives, that you can fight for your rights, that you can do something in your own country. And that's how I try to, to raise my child, like to say, you know, that, that's not the, that, that's not the solution, just to leave, because wherever you go, you will find some problems. And um, I think that there are uh, economical reasons, of course. Uh, uh, there is like, uh, th there is the issue of, of happiness, like where, where do you feel happy in, this, in, in some um, uh, EU country where things are really like set and you, you don't have to go to the streets every day. I, I really, I understand that, but I also think that the people are leaving because they don't have trust in their in their own power, like to fight for themselves. And I still see uh, some people who who have that that you know uh, that urge to, to to fight for themselves. And I don't agree with the general narrative where there, there is this narrative like the best people are leaving. No, I just think that those who are leaving. They're, they, they're happy in some different kind of way in some other place, and it's fine. It's not something that we should condemn. Uh, I, I think it's, it's just how it is, and that we shouldn't uh, like um, try to keep them if they want to leave. If they want to leave, that's, that's totally fine. 
and on, on transition and EU, I think I understood you and I agree with you. Those are like the buzzwords that we use for uh, like more than 20 years. I don't hate them, but I tried not to use them. I, I, th I think I didn't say transition uh, the, the, this evening. Uh, uh, I didn't use it because I agree, we are all, all transitioning, we are all dying, we are all, right? It's, that's the fact of life. And Serbia has its own transition uh, uh, from like, uh, there is a great book about Serbian political parties uh, from, uh, um, from Latinka Perović, like from anarchy to a, a, a autocracy. So we are like, we have our own internal 200 years old transition from anarchy to autocracy. And now we have to move towards democracy. And it's our own thing. I, I totally agree. We can lean on EU a little bit, but we cannot expect from the EU to do that for us. So I think that, yeah, it's not like the transition in terms of uh, how we use it in, in public life. It's, it's, it's really superficial. It's actually something much deeper than that, and it's in each and every society. Uh, and on war on, uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, actually, the Russian aggression, I think it's a moral issue. I think we should say it's unacceptable, and that's it. I'm not an expert, but as, an, as, as a citizen, I would, I would expect that from my government. Thank you, Sofia. Ivan? Uh, yeah, let me start with, with demography, and I think we can't overstate the issue, as, as Alida just said. You know, we, we've talked over these past two decades that we're, the Western Balkans is a region of 18 million. I think we're below 16 million now, in real terms, uh, because of the loss of population. Serbia officially has half a million less than 10 years ago. In fact, the, some of the statisticians have said 750,000 less. Macedonia has 250,000 people less. Bosnia is probably around 3 million. In 91, it had 4.2 or 4, I can't remember. Now it's, less than three. now it's less than 3. This is a dramatic issue in every regard. Economic, cultural, educational, political. Our populations are aging. Uh, our friend Ivan Krastev always talks about this in terms of what this does mean at the election and ballot box uh, when you have less people. And by the way, the biggest item in Serbia's budget are remittances. I think it's three to four billion uh, at this moment. And uh, half jokingly, people say Vienna is the best Serbian city to live in. Uh, so, uh, as, as you know, when you walk down the street, you hear more of our languages of, of various, various sorts. People leave for a variety of reasons. I call Germany the vacuum cleaner of our region. Everything is being sucked up, doctors, nurses, electricians, plumbers, drivers, uh, because of the statistic that Alida mentioned. These countries, Austria included, need, need people, and they prefer people from the Western Balkans than from other places. We won't get into that discussion right now. So uh, in that regard, I think we, we need to try and think, and uh, someone like Alida has been thinking, you know, how do we uh, address this, this issue? On uh, regional cooperation is fundamental. And we have, you know, it's very controversial for many, but the Open Balkans is something that ha was created in the region itself. It has flaws, it's imperfect, not all countries participate, but at least relations between Serbia and Albania haven't been better historically than they are at this moment, and about now 150,000 people from Serbia go to take their holiday in Albania, which was unimaginable uh, 10 years ago. So some things uh, are, are, uh, are working. On the, on the Russian aggression on Ukraine, again, as I mentioned, I was at this conference and the Serbian Prime Minister used the word Russian aggression on Ukraine, uh, which pleasantly surprised me. By that, I want to say that there is a, that there is a change in uh, some of the statements that are being used by the tabloids and the pro uh, pro-government uh, television stations, which means that I think we are moving towards some kind of sanctions. When exactly, I don't know. But as a citizen, I'm embarrassed that my country hasn't introduced sanctions yet. And as Han has uh, very rightly said, we are a European country. We want to join the European Union. 
And it's embarrassing that Serbia is the only European country that hasn't introduced sanctions. Yes, Serbia has condemned the Russian aggression, votes uh, at the UN uh, always. And what I didn't know, our Europe minister, Tanja Miščević, at this conference said that Serbia is sending electrical engineers to Ukraine to help them with their uh, energy grid. It is giving humanitarian aid. We have uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, in the country. And also, uh, some of you know, we have about 100,000 Russians in Serbia, Belgrade, and Novi Sad mostly. When you walk the center, you hear these people. These are younger, middle-class families, mostly from the urban bourgeois elites, IT, and I would guess most of them anti-Russian aggression of, of Ukraine. So it's a, it's a mixed picture, a, a more complex picture, which uh, one needs to understand. Uh, but as I said, I do expect um, that at some moment, and in fact the president has talked about it, that Serbia is paying a price for not having uh, introduced uh, sanctions. Let, let me just end on, uh, on Jinjic uh, again, uh, uh, because I think it, it, it behooves us to, to, to mention him. Uh, he was with uh, someone with the foot on the accelerator of changing and catching up. Uh, all the time that we had lost. He believed that we could catch up uh, Croatia uh, in joining the EU. He thought back then in 2001 that 2010 was the likely date. Uh, we know uh, what happened to that. But he had Kostunica with his foot on the brake of the same car. And the other thing that we need to remind ourselves, this was a very complex situation because Džinđić was the Prime Minister of the Republic of Serbia in still a federal state where the Montenegrin government was fully in the hands of Milosevic. Uh, Milosevic's wife was in the federal parliament until February of 2003 when she fled to Russia and where she eventually died. Milosevic's son is still living uh, in Russia under asylum. So, I think we, uh, when we judge the, the two, these two plus years, uh, the enormity of things that were done were, were quite incredible given the constraints that were put him. And I think that um, in terms of legacy, as many have said, and I will repeat it, he's still a very, very inspiring figure for all, all of us. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this concluding remarks. And to all our panelists, I would like to thank you for being here and for appreciating this, this panel discussion. Also to the audience, I would like to thank you very much and to encourage you to participate in our future discussions, either it be Eastern Europe or Southeastern Europe or the Balkans or on other topics. Please look upon our website and inform yourselves and come. Um, our cooperation partners, especially to mention Karana Institute and the OEP, thank you for always being here with us for the Western Balkans Initiative. I would like to close this panel by just one quote of Zoran Djindjic. And he said, we need to grow up as a society and to pay the price of this growing up. And this is a statement which I would like to conclude this session. And thank you very much. Snacks, wine, everything is outside. So please enjoy yourself. Thank <laughs> you.